Now we look at subsetting of tables. We already know about subsetting of data frames, uh, which is to put a square bracket and then specify the rows and columns that we want, or use the dollar sign to extract the value of a particular column. Similar thing. So here we are just again for practice, we are uh, creating a table. So, uh, but we are calling the table as df, although we are creating a table. So table x is random uniform five numbers and y is random normal five numbers, right? So we are creating five random numbers, calling them x, five another random numbers, calling them y. So your table now has two columns, x and y, both of which have five numbers, okay? You can extract a column by name. So you can say df dollar x. Remember, df is actually a table. So if you say df dollar x, because x is the column name, you'll get back the result, which is this. Now, of course, as an aside, if you want to restrict the number of uh, digits that are output. So for example, the first value is 0 0.75, 0 0.0752, 0 0.9764, etc. Uh, so if you want to restrict it to a certain number of digits, you can set at the global level options digits equals 3. This is generally uh, true for R in general, nothing to do with dplyr or with tables or anything. So you say options digits equals 3 and then after that if you print out, it will print up to three decimal, uh, three digits but there are some exceptions. So for example, in the present case, it's actually printing four digits, 0 0.0753, 0 0.9764, etc. Why is it printing four digits when we told it to print three digits? Okay, that is happening because this one has a leading zero, 0 0.0753. And because it has a leading zero, it prints one extra digit for us. So it's printing uh, three digits, excluding the zeros. Okay, so if you really want it to, uh, to check that it, it really works, let's create a vector with three numbers, none of which has a leading zero. And I remember our options for printing is three digits. Here, of course, we are creating uh, the data. So this is what we type in. So now when you print out Z, you see that it actually prints out only up to three digits. Okay, this is just something to think about because when you're using R interactively and it starts printing a truckload of, uh, of digits and you want it to uh, round it off to a certain number of smaller digits, you can always use the options. Uh, but beware that if there are leading zeros, then it's going to print uh, three digits with, without including the zero. Returning to subsetting, you can subset uh, by variable name within quotes by using the double square bracket, right? So we say df, which is the name of our table, and we use double square brackets and put the column name uh, within quotes, uh, you'll get the first column. You can also, of course, use the column position df1, which is the first column is x, you will get the results this way also. Now we can use the old data frame single square bracket row column format, but typically we will not be using the, uh, the column format especially, uh, mainly because we will be selecting columns using our dplyr functions, select and, and all of those things, right? Or we will be using filter uh, to filter values and so on. So we will not have to result, revert to the row column way of subsetting data frames. Instead, we'll be using these new approaches. But of course, if, you, if the need arises, you can use the row column format also because after all, tables are data frames, right? So you can use these uh, things with pipes as well. Right. So the, the column uh, dollar sign thing with pipes as well, except that you have to use the dot placeholder. Right. So if you want to say df and then pipe it to get the uh, x, quad, uh, x uh, column, you can do df dot x. So it's like saying df dollar x. Right. So this is also compatible with the pipe notation. And of course, the same thing when you do df square bracket 1, uh, square bracket, square bracket 1, or square bracket, square bracket x, you can also use the dot notation okay, for piping. So these, this dot notation placeholder is valid specifically for piping. So when using these subscripting methods with pipes, use the dot placeholder when working with pipes. So this is how it works. Now, uh, the reason why we avoid using the single square bracket for subsetting in tables is the following, right? It works differently with data frames and tables. And uh, sometimes what you have is you have old code and the old code seems to rely on uh, the 
square bracket, single square bracket notation, in which case you can convert your table to a data frame by using as.data.frame tb. Okay, so you could do that. Now, the reason we say that uh, the single square bracket notation is avoided when we work with dplyr is the following. So let's say we create a data frame with two columns ABC and XYZ and both of them have just one value, right? So this is uh, a data frame with one row and two columns, okay? Now we can extract the value of a particular row in three different ways. You can do df $x or df comma XYZ which is to extract one single column Okay, and the result is uh, a vector in general, but of course in this case the result is just a single value. Okay, but it's a vector with one value. That's what it, uh, the result turns out to be if you retrieve one column. On the other hand, if you retrieve multiple columns, more than one column, then the result comes out as a data frame. Okay, so this is a little bit of an annoying uh, inconsistency and that is why uh, when we use uh, the single square bracket notation, we have this problem. So we don't use that. Uh, with tibbles, whatever you do, the return value is always a tibble. Whether you get back one column or whether you get, whether you get back two columns, the return value is always a tibble. So it's a little more consistent in that sense. So let's look at the read.cs, read underscore csv function. If you recall, the read underscore csv function is used to read uh, csv files directly as tibbles as opposed to read.csv which would read them in as data frames. Uh, the read underscore csv function has several advantages and we should try and use it as far as possible because it's about 10 times faster than read.csv and when your data set is very large like you know a uh, couple of hundred thousand rows then a read underscore csv will read much faster than read.csv. Uh, they produce tibbles as we've already seen, read underscore csv produces a tibble. It does not convert any character values to factors which uh, read uh, dot csv would do and in general it produces better cross-platform behavior in the sense that you write some code and you run it on the Mac, you run it on Windows, you run it on Linux, the results are all going to be predictable. With read dot csv that may not be the case because it inherits some platform specific behavior which differs across these platforms. Let us now turn our attention to how to represent data in general. Okay, So how should we represent data? Now what we'll do now is consider uh, some data which is uh, represented, uh, you know the same information is represented in many different ways and then we look at uh, which one is, is better. Okay. So let's say there is a table one which is looks like this. You've got country, year, cases, population. So for example, Afghanistan, 1999, 745 cases. This is cases of, uh, I think, cholera uh, out of a population of, uh, you know, uh, 19 million. Okay. In Afghanistan in the year 2000, you had 2,666 cases in a population of about 20.5 million and so on. So that's the information they have. It is represented in table one like this. The same information is represented in table two like this. Right? So you've got Afghanistan 1999 cases, 745. Afghanistan 1999 population, 19 million. Afghanistan 2000 cases, 2,666 and so on. Right? So the information contained, uh, contained in these two tables is exactly the same but uh, it's represented in two different ways. Okay, now let's consider a third option to do the same thing. This time it's represented in a somewhat more uh, bizarre way. So we've got Afghanistan 1999 and the number of cases and the population is combined into one column under the, uh, you know, under the column name rate. Of course, rate is not a numeric column. It is a character column which shows the expression using which you will compute the rate. Okay, this is admittedly pretty bizarre, but you never know the kind of things that happen when you uh, when you encounter data, which is exactly why we need to wrangle and get the data into good form. Finally, the same data might be spread across two tables, and table 4a contains the number of cases for the countries, Afghanistan, Brazil, and China, and uh, 
table 4b which consists of the number of we consists of the population for these three countries for the two years right so the information is the same uh, again uh, the same information that was contained in table 1 is now contained in table 4a and 4b separately okay now the reason this might have happened is that the source for these two data might have been different and somebody has just created these okay so now we face the question of how should we represent data which is the best is table 1 better 2 3 or 4a 4b combination which one is really the best way of representing data let's look at a basic guiding principle of representing data so ideally what we want is let's say this is our data this happens to be how data is represented in the first column in the first table uh, table 1 okay ideally we want to have one column per attribute or variable right so we have attributes country year cases population each one has a column that's the way we want it and we want one row per observation right so here the observation is all the attributes of a country year combination so afghanistan 1999 had some number of cases some population afghanistan 2000 had some number of cases some population right so the basic entity that is being captured here is uh, uh, a country year combination and there are several attributes describing a country year combination okay so each observation consists of all the relevant data for one country year combination and what we want is one row per such observation and finally we want one cell per value right a value itself uh, each cell uh, should occupy one value and each value should occupy one cell okay we don't want uh, multiple values crammed into a particular cell and we don't obviously don't want a value divided across multiple cells okay that seldom happens but again that could happen as well so when data follows this kind of principle these rules Hadley Wickham the creator of uh, dplyr and the creator of ggplot he calls it as tidy data right so tidy data has one column per variable or attribute one row per observation and one cell per value. So according to our criteria, the data as represented in table one is tidy data, right? So this is the tidy representation and this is what we want in representing our data. So first of all, if, they, if the data we have is in some other form, like what we showed in table two, three and four A, four B combination, then our first job before we do any analysis would be to tidy it up, that is convert it into this form and then perform analysis, right? So what is so great about tidy data? So let's look at some sample operations on tidy data, okay? So let's say we want to compute the rate per 10,000 of population, rate meaning rate of cholera or whatever the data that is represented. So you have the number of cases and you have the population. So the rate is number of cases divided by population but we want it per 10,000 of population, so we can multiply that result by 10,000. We can achieve all of this very easily by saying table 1, which is tidy, pipe it and use the dplyr function we spoke about earlier, mutate. And then we say compute rate as cases by divided by population times 10,000. That's it. So after this, uh, the result will have, in addition to the columns that already exist, we'll have one more column called rate, which is cases divided by population times 1000, okay? It's very straightforward to do this computation if your data is tidy. Or compute the number of cases per year, right? Which is going to be uh, table one, and then count year weight cases. We saw this earlier when we were discussing dplyr. So count year would be basically count the number of, uh, uh, you know, for, for each year, count the number of occurrences, Okay, and then weight equals cases. So it's going to uh, weight and add up all the cases. So you're going to get a weighted addition of the cases, which will turn out to be the number of cases per year, okay? uh, which is the number of cases across all the countries per year. Okay. So that is again very easy to do with this. Okay. Now, uh, again, suppose you want to visualize the changes over time, right? That is for the three countries, visualize uh, the number of cases 
1999 and the number of cases in 2000 as a chart. Again, it's very easy to do. You can say ggplot table 1, comma aesthetic, year, comma cases. Right? We want year on the x-axis, cases on the y-axis. And of course, year has two values, 1999 and 2000. So we can do geom line aesthetic group equals country. Right? So which means that we want to plot one separate graph, the line graph per country. So when we say group equals country, uh, the data gets grouped by country and the geom line will be plotted one for each country. Okay, And then we can say color equals gray 50, whatever. And then we say geom point aesthetic color equals country. Right, So the points also, uh, the lines uh, are plotted in uh, a fixed color, whereas the points are plotted in a color that depends on the country. So if you do all of this, you get a chart that looks like this. Very easy to create this chart, right? Because our data is tidy. It's not difficult to create this chart. Okay, So the, the colors of the points depend upon the country. The line itself is fixed as a gray 50. And uh, we got one line per, uh, per country. And we got that because we said group equals country. So once again, very straightforward way of creating this chart.